Okay, so it's my job in introducing today's commencement speaker to go beyond the impressive list of accomplishments you already have in your programs. However, very early into my research of Dr. Chu's career, I discovered that despite his 70-hour work weeks as energy secretary, he's continued to publish scientific articles, including two nature papers last year. He claims, and I quote, that, that writing these papers is the equivalent for him of vegging out in front of the TV. <laughs> At this point, my pride in introducing an experimental physicist as commencement speaker became a paralyzing crisis of self-esteem. <laughs> so rather than trying to dig deeper, I'll stick to talking about what I know, already know well, the atom cooling and trapping experiments that earned Dr. Chu a share of the 1997 Nobel Prize in Physics. So I want to explain to you why these experiments are actually exceptional, even by Nobel Prize standards, in my opinion. It was already known before these experiments that lasers could apply forces to atoms, but everyone was pretty sure that atoms were moving too fast that the, and these forces were too small to actually trap them. But what Dr. Chu's group discovered was that you could use lasers to cool the atoms down and slow them enough that you could actually collect them in another, in another laser trap of a different color. Now, pulling off this type of experiment that had eluded scientists for 16 years is the stuff of Nobel Prize winning work, but that wasn't enough for Dr. Chu. What Dr. Chu's group learned was that in only a year later was that by applying a magnetic field to these lasers that were cooling the atoms, you could, rather than, you could go from catching just a few hundred atoms in your laser trap to amassing millions and millions of atoms in a very robust and stable trap, which we now know as a magneto-optical trap. These simple-to-make atom traps have revolutionized both low temperature and atomic physics and helped lead to the 2001 Nobel Prize. And in fact, they're so simple to operate now that we won't do this, but I could ask Joel Schumann, who's sitting in the audience right now, to run across the street, run his experiment that he built over the last year, and trap maybe a billion atoms and be back in time to collect his diploma. <laughs> we won't ask him to do that. All right, so to put this another way, what Dr. Chu did wasn't just an impossible experiment. He figured out how to make an impossible experiment simple. And to prove once more that no good deed goes unpunished, Dr. Chu's non-Swedish reward for this, for this accomplishment made him perfectly qualified for his new job as energy secretary, <laughs> a position responsible for weaning the United States off its fossil fuel addiction in a politically feasible way, in essence, making the impossible simple. <laughs> so I guess if this is your day job, maybe publishing notable scientific papers to relax starts to make some sense. <laughs> Mr. President, on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the faculty of Pomona College, it is my great honor to present to you Stephen Chu for the honorary degree of Doctor of Science. Stephen Chu, by the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Science in Pomona College, honoris causa. Well, it's great to be here and not, uh, it was actually three nature papers last year. <laughs> um, anyway, Thank you for letting me share this wonderful day with you. And uh, to the new graduates, congratulations on your achievements. I feel especially honored to be chosen to speak at this commencement, the 47th anniversary of Polona's discovery that the number 41 is special. <laughs> I agree. I was conceived in 1947. <laughs> on this special year, there is an additional pressure to say something memorable, something that will be remembered 47 years from now. And ha, you say, most commencement speeches are forgotten in less than 47 hours. But wait, I have a plan. Now normally commencement speakers are like corpses at an Irish wake. We're, we're needed for the ceremony, but nobody expects us to say much. <laughs> Now, in honor of the number 47, I've decided to structure my remarks after Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. In the book, we see Ebenezer Scrooge as stingy, sour, self-centered, the stereotype of, for want of a better word, a Scrooge. But there's another young Ebenezer who is gregarious, good-willed, and generous. What determines the ultimate fate of Scrooge were visits from the ghosts of Christmas's past, the present, and yet to come. So in my commencement, Carol, I will remind you of the times 47 years ago, 
you'll see a view of the present and a glimpse of a world 47 years yet to come. So the ghost of commencements 47 years ago reveals a civil rights movement in full stride. Martin Luther King, then 35 years old, became the youngest Nobel Peace Prize recipient. The US and the Soviet Union were in a nuclear arms race and a space race. Seven years earlier, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik into Earth orbit, and America was shocked. We had taken our technical leadership for granted, but Sputnik made it clear that our German rocket scientists were not as good as the Soviet's German rocket scientists. <laughs> Sputnik's launch was seen as a threat to our national security. President Eisenhower could have focused on defense funding, but he took a longer view. A few weeks after Sputnik, he responded by calling for increased education of scientists and engineers and a stronger commitment to basic research. Less than a year later, Congress passed the National Defense Education Act to improve math and science education at all levels. In 1961, President Kennedy challenged our nation to land a man on the moon within a decade. And President Kennedy's call to action inspired America's youth. When we landed the first man on the moon, the majority of engineers at NASA's mission control were in their 20s, and their atmosphere was electric. Quote, we were given this impossible dream by President Kennedy, and we were living it. We were doing the kinds of things that engineers would kill for, and surprised we were getting paid as long as we had enough money to make ends meet, that's all we needed. I, too, am a product of our nation's response to Sputnik. I was supported in summer science research programs in high school and college, and with National Science Foundation graduate and postdoctoral fellowships. So the ghost of Christmas commencements, sorry, not Christmas, the ghost of commencements present reminds us we're living in a time that's no less stressful, no less exciting, and even more critical. We're recovering from the worst recession since the Great Depression. The unemployment rate is still high, and many of you may be worried about finding a job. But you're not alone. Your parents are also worried. <laughs> <laughs> Globalization has opened new doors, but has also increased competition. Our troops are fighting in Afghanistan. Unrest is sweeping through the Middle East, North Africa, and Asia. Science is telling us our carbon emissions are changing our climate and endangering our planet. And there's an ancient Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. Now, according to the most authoritative source of our times, Wikipedia, it appears that the expression may have been in English origin. But regardless of the origin, it still resonates today, but it's not a curse. Interesting times are filled with risk, but they're also filled with hope and possibility. The times of greatest challenge provide the greatest opportunities. Now, the Ghost of commencement 47 years yet to come brings us to the year 2058. You're here in your class reunion. And to quote or paraphrase a Simon Garfunkel song, can you imagine years from today? How terribly strange to be 70. The awkward, embarrassing moments of your youth have faded, except for the stuff you were dumb enough to post on the internet. <laughs> To the delight of Pomona, you fondly remember your Halcyon College days, and many of you will have children, some will have grandchildren. But now here's my plan to help you remember my speech. I ask you to write in your college yearbook, your college yearbook, not your commencement program, <laughs> but you'll throw that away, how your life will unfold in the next 47 years. Write down what the world will be like and your role in shaping its destiny. Make a note that the Secretary of Energy inspired you to do this. <laughs> I know it's a cheap trick, but it's worth a try. <laughs> and you've got to do this today before you forget what I said. So here are two visions of the future. In one future, Europe and Asia, no, most notably China, lead the clean energy technologies. In 2058, the United States is a laggard. Industry leaders, clinging to the old way of doing business, convinced Americans that putting a price on carbon is a job killer. Without voices of concerned citizens and leaders, our transition to clean energy was delayed. While there were some government policies that encouraged investments in energy efficiency and clean energy, 
They were erratic, inconsistent, and largely impotent. The vast majority of our solar modules, wind turbines, and electrical distribution equipment are imported. Our economy has been eclipsed by China. The price of oil is $278 a barrel. And while electric vehicles are widely used, most are imported. After decades of a national strategy best described as hope for the best, plan for the best, we lost our economic advantage. The world's carbon emissions continued to rise as business as usual, but by 2058, the full dangers of climate change are obvious. Many of the warnings of the climate scientists in 2011 have come true, but the few scientists who survived 20-year droughts of funding are despairing too little, too late. Floods of the century, including our current flood, now average once a decade. Scorching summer droughts threaten our agriculture from Kansas to California. Fierce hurricanes in the preceding decades have this devastating impact on the Gulf. And because of climate change, some of the world's most fragile economies in Asia, Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa have collapsed. The intense storms, rising sea levels, and growing deserts have resulted in tens of millions of climate refugees and climate-associated deaths. There's another happier version of the 2058 Pomona commencement. The nation passed a set of measures that led the world on a sustainable energy path. As a result, major investments in modernizing our energy infrastructure generated unprecedented job growth and prosperity. Knowing that oil prices were likely to keep rising with each passing decade, we diversified our sources of transportation energy. We now lead the world in the development of electric vehicles, advanced biofuels, and the most efficient cars and trucks. Most of our energy is renewable based on technologies invented and built in America. American agriculture is still the most productive in the world. The carbon emissions in the United States and the rest of the developed world is one-fifth what it was in 2011, the world carbon emissions peaked in 2040, and it now appears that the worst risks of climate change were avoided. While there's still significant impacts, the world is economically robust enough to adapt to climate change. Now, a frightened Scrooge asked the ghost of Christmas yet to come, are these the shadows of things that will be, or are they the shadows of things that may be? And as we all know, our fate lies not in the stars, but in ourselves. So let's return to the present. For most of my adult life, my central focus and professional joy has been doing physics. And like the people at NASA's mission control, the money didn't matter as long as I had enough to make ends meet. During the 26 years I was at Stanford and Bell Labs, I don't think I ever took more than a three or four day vacation simply because I didn't want to take vacation. As I began my downward spiral from professor to administrator to government bureaucrat, <laughs> I now need vacations. <laughs> you may wonder why someone like me would ever consider leaving the life of a professor to become a director of a national laboratory or to leave academia to become secretary of energy. And despite the trials and tribulations of running a large bureaucracy and being part of a political world, I feel privileged to be where I am. And why? Because I believe that the energy and climate challenge is one of the most pressing problems the world has to solve. This is this generation's Sputnik moment. So what needs to be done? We have to plan for where the world's going to be in the coming decades, not in the coming election cycle. When the great hockey player Wayne Gretzky was asked how he positioned himself on the ice, he replied, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it's been. America should do the same. Wishing to return to the past is not a good plan. There's an upside to the energy and climate challenge, and many other countries have realized this. Europe and Asian countries recognizing these opportunities are moving aggressively. Although the United States built the first electricity transmission system in the world, China has the highest voltage transmission lines. We built the first nuclear reactor, the first solar cell, the first modern wind turbines, but technological leadership has moved to Europe and Asia. While we've fallen behind, we can and must rise to the challenge. A half a century ago, as Sputnik orbited the Earth, we revved up the great American innovation machine and won the space race. The stakes 
are much higher in today's sustainable, sustainable energy challenge. Today, all nations need to be part of the solution, and all nations will benefit. Now, in the final part of my commencement speech, I have to fulfill my sacred obligation, and that's to give you advice you didn't ask for. <laughs> so my advice is simple. Do something. Do something you love and give it your all. You don't want to be like Peter Gibbons in the movie Office Space, or I hope you don't. <laughs> and as you may recall, one of the Bobs tells Peter, looks like you've been missing a lot of work lately, to which Peter replies, I wouldn't say I've been missing it, Bob. <laughs> the thing is, Bob, it's not that I'm lazy, it's just that I don't care. Life is too short to go through it without caring deeply about something. Do something that matters. Do something that <clears throat> matters beyond your immediate world. And when you're an old and gray and look back on your life, you'll want to be proud of what you have done. The source of that pride won't be the things you've acquired or the recognition you've received. It will be the lives you've touched and the difference you have made. You've had the opportunity here at Pomona to stretch your intellectual wings, the privilege to wonder, to think, to create. With this privilege, you have the responsibility to recognize the opportunities and seize the moment. Invest in the time to learn more about what's at stake and act on that knowledge. There are great economic and business reasons to invest in a sustainable future, but for me, the bottom line is not the bottom line. For me, what we do about climate change is deeply moral. The world is a deeply interwoven in space and in time. As Martin Luther King wrote in his letter from a Birmingham jail 48 years ago, he said, we are tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Above all, we must value and protect the most innocent members of our society, the children of the world yet to be born. I end my remarks with, an with the astrophysicist Carl Sagan, and he wrote of an image taken by Voyager 1 as it was leaving our solar system. In this picture, Earth appears as a pale blue dot of light embedded in a rainbow. He says, look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived on this moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. Like it or not, this is where we make our stand. This distant image of our tiny world underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. To this message, I add an ancient Native American saying, treat the earth well, it was not given to you by your parents. It was loaned to you by your children. You, the class of 2011, are living in interesting times. Carpe diem. America's youth, 47 years ago, transformed the world. Today, you have an opportunity to do more than just change our world. You have an opportunity to help save it. So congratulations. Go out and celebrate, but before you do, spend a few moments writing in your yearbook <laughs> how your life and the world unfolded 47 years from today. And after that, go out and do something. Do something you love. Do something that matters. Do something for the children of the world yet to be born. Do something to preserve and cherish our pale blue dot. Thank you.